...lovely manners and cut-glass accent, he was infinitely credible, however little he knew about the subject at hand. He was biddable, nerveless, and ready to be deployed in the trickiest of situations. "'Oh, here he is,' continued Bernie, as Dave, every inch the cheerful ex-copper, approached holding a tray laden with pints, smiling as he dispensed splashes of bitter over the seated customers among whom he weaved in size fourteen boots. Roy could well imagine Dave, uniformed up in dark blue serge, helmeted, red-faced as the laughing policeman. And that fucking bastard Vinny. How come he's not here? What did you say again? They turned to Roy. Patiently above the din, he explained. Vinny's down to Seven Oaks tidying up. The office in Seven Oaks had been their base for the last three months. He's the only one who didn't meet the clients. At this word, the assembled party chuckled. The chances of that bunch turning up down there are minimal, but you can't be too careful. Sage nods all around. It was, in fact, Vincent's nephew, Barry, who had earned a sly two hundred pounds to go down to Seven Oaks in his overalls unscrew the brass nameplate, wash down all the surfaces inside, and clear out all traces of their existence. But that was part of another story, yet to reach its piquant denouement. They drank to absent friends, by which they meant Vinny, and discussed the latest model Range Rovers that they were thinking of buying. They did not touch on their personal lives, their wives or mistresses or children, or their homes. If questioned, they were just mates who met up for a drink and a laugh every so often. Roy presumed that each lived somewhere within the bounds of the M25, but outside the mighty city itself, in that mangled no-man's land of suburbanized villages and towns, industrial wasteland, clusters of prefabricated metal DIY superstores and carpet warehouses. He assumed the others had carved out a small slice of grand comfort in the orbital motorway's ambit, a green and pleasant acre or three, topped off by a modest mansion and protected by fences, cameras, and on-call 24-7 security. For Roy, things were somewhat different. He lived alone in a modest flat in Beckenham. His earnings were stockpiled, awaiting the next step, the next leap indeed. Roy felt the left side of his chest tingle pleasurably, just on the nipple. This was what he had been waiting for with quiet inner anticipation. In this din, others would not have noticed his mobile phone, on silent, vibrating in the pocket of his shirt. He let it buzz, and shortly it stopped. He took a calm swig of beer and said, Off to the gens, lads. Got to point Percy at the porcelain. Could be a while. You know me and my bladder. He stood and affected a drunken shamble toward the lavatory. Once inside, he took a small bottle of mouthwash from his jacket pocket and gargled, splashed a little eau de cologne on his face, straightened his tie, and combed back his distinguished white hair. He looked in the mirror and saw a bold, forceful man. He felt a frisson of excitement. This is what it's all about, he thought. He smiled to himself and left the toilet by the other door, the one close by the exit. Outside, allowing his eyes no more than a moment to adjust to the sunlight, he crossed the road briskly, straight and true to the bank opposite. He had chosen his ground carefully. Inside, he was met by a smiling Vincent and shook hands with the business manager. He was ushered into a private office. He looked at his watch and explained apologetically that he had only a few minutes before he needed to be on his way to his next meeting. Politicians, he said, with a self-deprecating, rueful smile and raise of the eyebrows. Ministers. No problem, sir, no problem, purred the manager. Everything is ready for your signature. Coffee was offered and politely declined. The documents were laid before Roy, and he read them carefully, double-checking the numbers, though he knew well only a few hundred pounds would be left in the account after this transaction.